I'm, uh, I'm Dean Pruitt. It, it said in the uh, uh, program and on my badge that I was from Yale University and that information is just 55 years old. <laughs> I was at Yale, maybe uh, 52 years ago. Um, uh, but I am an icon. A perpetual visiting office. Um, I, I think that I, I want to congratulate the gone from uh, some graphic and uh, chilling descriptions of uh, war and civilian casualties. We've had very interesting uh, reports on uh, incidents and uh, uh, <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> uh, the, the trends over time. Uh, and uh, then we've had some, uh, some important uh, uh, panels and speakers uh, about uh, possible solutions. Um, I thought the one on law was the most uh, fully developed. Uh, uh, the uh, importance of awareness uh, and uh, uh, owning the problem was, uh, I think, a very, very provocative uh, uh, <coughs> point made by our uh, luncheon speaker. And uh, in, in, in uh, some of the panels, we've also talked about process, uh, dehumanization, uh, the uh, blurring of boundaries between civilians combatants, uh, and uh, these, these provide handles for developing possible solutions. Uh, this panel is, is on solutions completely, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it comes down to, to the uh, workday level, where we have people that are, uh, are part of or have organized uh, uh, actual organizations uh, that uh, try to uh, protect civilians in one way or the other, and uh, I think it would be very, very interesting. Um, our, uh, our first speaker is uh, Mark Velasco from Human Rights Watch. Thank you. I, I would like to first thank you all for having me here. I really appreciate it, Dr. Rothbard, very kind of you. And I'd like to thank you all for still being here. <laughs> it is now ten after a quarter after four on a Friday afternoon one of two things is going on. Either you all have incredibly high expectations for this panel, or your social lives need some serious work. <laughs> Perhaps both, so I, I, I wish you all the best. I'm gonna very quickly tell you a little bit about Human Rights Watch and my own work, uh, and then I'll go into some ideas of uh, different ways that I see from the uh, work in the field, how we can perhaps improve civilian protections to some extent. Human Rights Watch is the largest U.S.-based uh, human rights organization. We have approximately 250 people working in about 70 different countries. Uh, a number of different divisions within Human Rights Watch that work on human rights issues, everything from, uh, from gay rights uh, to conflict. And we, we really run the gamut. There's an awful lot of different things that we cover. I'm in the Emergencies Division. I'm the Senior Military Analyst. The Emergencies Division is the group within Human Rights Watch that deploys within 24 hours to a conflict zone. So for example, uh, as soon as Israel uh, began the conflict in Gaza, I was on the plane heading over there. I spent about four weeks in Israel and Gaza uh, working on that conflict. We just put out our first report yesterday uh, on uh, the use of white phosphorus during the conflict. <coughs> I, I welcome you to look at it. We are coming out with another five reports in the next weeks. Uh, one will be covering the use of unmanned aerial vehicles uh, during the conflict by Israel. Another will be covering Hamas's violations against Palestinians during the conflict, those who are collaborators, for example. Uh, we will have another one on Hamas um, shielding and uh, uh, launching of rockets. Uh, we'll also be looking at wanton destruction uh, by the Israeli Defense Forces. And so a, a, a number of, oh, and finally, I'm sorry, white flag incidents, so when civilians would be surrendered. So we, we spend our times in the conflict as it's happening, at least the emergencies division, so that we can comment during the conflict on what's going on, to try to stop the fighting, to try to get the warring parties to change their actions, uh, to influence them, and then in the final analysis to write our reports and, and to get change. Uh, and we work on conflicts all around the world. I, for example, have been to 
Iraq, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Georgia, Gaza, and these are all during the fighting. You know, it's not like I go as a tourist some years later. It's while the fighting is still actively going on. Uh, so that gives you just a general flavor of, uh, of my work at Human Rights Watch. And just just to, uh, uh, to throw it out there so that uh, it, it's out there, uh, I spent about seven years on the Joint Staff in the Pentagon. Uh, my last job was Chief of High Value Targeting during the Iraq invasion in 2003. Uh, I led the um, uh, team in the Pentagon, the cell that was targeting Hussein and his um, cronies. And we had a number of other cells, but that was my position. So just so it's out there. Now, about this uh, discussion that we've been having today, I found it to be very useful. I found it to be very post Westphalian. Uh, very Judeo-Christian, and that's fine. We're in the U.S., and it's understandable that we have a very U.S.-centric uh, approach to things, but uh, just to throw that out there. Uh, what I'm going to discuss now, and especially from Human Rights Watch's perspective, is the law. All right, Human Rights Watch is a legal organization. We deal with international humanitarian law. We are not talking about what's right and what's wrong. We are talking about the law, what's permissible and what's not permissible, and that's, that's what I'm going to discuss. Before I get into that though, I would like to make one point which I, I think is the most important point that I will make today. So uh, instead of building up to it, let me throw it out there to you right now. And, and folks at Human Rights Watch may, may slay me for saying this, but I truly believe this. We have spent our time here today, and Human Rights Watch as an organization spends all of its time in conflict, dealing with Yusindelo issues, which is the conduct of war under international law how wars are fought, how militaries go about their conduct during war. Perhaps we should think about Gus Adela, the just war theories, the reasons for going to war. Should we be fighting a certain conflict, for example? And so I just throw that out there because we oftentimes get so caught up in how nations actually conduct hostilities that we lose sight of whether or not those hostilities need to happen. I just throw that out there for you. Now, the construct under which we have to operate is IHL, International Humanitarian Law, also known as Laws of Armed Conflict, or the Geneva Conventions, depending upon what seat you're sitting in and what hat you've got on. It is legal to kill civilians. It is legal. We may not like it, but that's the way it is. However, there is a qualitative difference between targeting civilians and accidental deaths. Now, that does not mean that they are not both important. So for example, let's look at Afghanistan. The Taliban there are actively targeting civilians every day. And it's important in the right to watch our work to talk about that. US and NATO forces are also killing civilians. These are, and I've, I've done an awful lot of work in Afghanistan, these are by and large accidental deaths. However, just because they're accidental does not mean that they're not important, nor that we should focus heavily on them. I think especially when you look at Afghanistan and how civilian casualties in Afghanistan have had such an incredible effect on the conflict there that we can see that it is very important to, while differentiate between targeted death, target killing, and accidental, they're both very important to deal with. Now I'm gonna go through seven points on things that I've come up with that I think that could be implemented or areas that we need to focus on or look at uh, that will in some way improve civilian protection. Uh, I believe number three is probably the most important. I will work up to three and then down to seven, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, I, I need to build things up. We really need to work on improving the compliance with the Geneva Conventions. Uh, I believe, I truly believe that the laws of armed conflict as they exist now uh, can effectively protect civilians in conflict if all parties will adhere to them. Uh, of course, we have to recognize there is a serious problem with non-state actors. And we have to look at, you know, some of the qualitative differences. Let me actually, let me start looking at Gaza, just very quickly, make a comment on Gaza. Um, Dr. Rothbard, I wish that the eight to one ratio was what we're living with today. If we accept the numbers from the, from the, from the Israelis on civilians killed in Gaza in this operation, you know, there were 10 Israeli uh, soldiers killed during the fight. Of those, the Israelis killed their own, killed seven of their own in blue on blue incidents. That, that leaves three soldiers dead. If we accept the, Palestine, the Israeli numbers of 300 civilians being killed, that's a 100 to one ratio. 
if we accept the Palestinian number of 900 civilians dead, then, then that's a 300 to 1 ratio. So it's just, an 8 to 1 would be, would be fantastic if we're not there. Looking at, at Gaza, you're looking at very loose rules of engagement. You're looking at a, one of the most recent examples of, of modern conflict in which a nation went in, fought, which states that they followed the Geneva Conventions, and basically threw the book out. Uh, we're talking about uh, attacks that targeted civilians. We're talking about attacks uh, in which uh, indiscriminate weapons were used. We're also talking about attacks in which discriminate weapons were used in an indiscriminate manner. And so this is an example of in, in which if a nation would have followed uh, the Geneva Conventions, laws of armed conflict, I don't think we would have seen the casualties that we saw. Secondly, and I have to greatly disagree with the first presentation today about the importance of the press. You need to have the press and human rights monitors in a conflict. They must have access. We were barred by the Israeli Defense Forces from day one. And because of that, we were not able to influence that conflict as it happened. I truly believe that had we been there and had the press been there from the first moment, the world would have seen what was going on through a much different lens. Pressure would have been placed upon the Israeli government. Perhaps the air war would have gone on, but the ground war may never have happened. And I, we saw a, a massive shift in casualties from the air war to the ground war. I'm not saying that, that, that the air war was, was, was right qualitatively, but we did see a huge shift. And so I think we must have press and human rights monitors, whether you like the, what they say is immaterial. You have to have them because eventually, and as we're seeing now with the Israeli soldiers coming out, the truth will come out. But if it comes out in dribs and drabs or over time, that is not as helpful as, it, as if it comes out the moment that it's going on. Point three, and what I think is a critical issue. We have incredibly weak enforcement right now. Incredibly weak enforcement. We must hold perpetrators to justice. We must, I think that is absolutely critical. We have to fight the culture of impunity that exists, not only on, in some militaries, but on some nation state levels. Look at the statements by Edward Ulmer at the conclusion of the Gaza conflict. For a nation's prime minister to stand up and state, we will stand behind our military, no matter what they did. If they committed a crime, they will not be prosecuted. All right, we may have our own internal investigations, but let's be honest about what's going to happen. But Omar basically stated, carte blanche. Had George Bush done this, after Abu Ghraib, the world would have torn itself to pieces. Now, the Abu Ghraib investigations and how people were held to justice or accountability were certainly not the gold standard, but it was far better than what we're seeing right now in Israel. So I think the issue of justice is paramount. Next, war. We need to really work on breaking the logjam at the Security Council. And the logjam is created by a number of nations. One, the United States, and I'm not just picking on the whole Israel issue here. A number of issues, the Security Council, because of the United States, it will not budge. But also China and Russia, depending upon the conflict, depending upon uh, who calls who a terrorist, uh, those nations will block things at the UN. And you have paralysis. We have paralysis at the UN because at the Security Council level, nothing moves. And then finally on the UN issue, I have to say the budgets are a joke. We have, um, you know, peacekeeping forces in Africa, for example, where some sheriff departments in the United States have larger budgets. And I'm serious, this is not a joke. Uh, it, it's got to change. Five, treaties, international agreements work, they're important. Okay, I worked for, for over five years on getting the Bannon cluster bombs put into place. I saw my first cluster bomb field in Iraq in 2003. And had you told me that on December the 4th of 2008, I would be standing in Oslo as we were signing the treaty Bannon cluster bombs, I, I would never have thought it would have been possible. But indeed, now we do have 95 nations on board with 107 potentially committing. We have a mine ban treaty. Uh, we also have uh, other arms control treaties. And the ICC is critical, it's very important. Uh, now, uh, we don't, I don't have time to go into it right now because of, because of, of, of time issues. Uh, but these are all treaty bodies that we need to push the US on. Now, I know we've been very US-centric here, and I've said that, that you know, maybe we don't always want to do that. But let's face facts, the US is so critical 
that when I, for Human Rights Watch, go to the Chinese, for example, and I bitch them out about their human rights abuses, they say to me, don't talk to us, look at what your own country is doing. So the U.S. really is very critical. So if we can get the U.S. on board for mind ban, for cluster ban, et cetera, I think we can really make some serious scars in the ICC as well. Sixth, uh, human rights monitors, humanitarians, people like myself, like Sarah, uh, we need to engage with the military, and the military needs to engage with us, and we do. Uh, I think it's, it's happening more and more. It's very much the US and the UK, it's going on right now, I think very strong, it's very positive. General Petraeus, for example, uh, had me in to review uh, FM324, which is the counterinsurgency field manual, as they were writing it. So it shows that there is definitely a movement to do that, definitely a movement to, to engage. The reason we need engagement is because not only do we need to understand each other and, and, and lose this idea of, of mistrust, but we need to get some critical things moving. We need to, and I'm sure Sarah will talk about it, we need to get uh, some kind of civilian casualty monitoring system in place. We do not have that in the United States. When I did targeting, uh, we had models that would spit out potentials for casualty numbers, and we never validated those models. So of what, what use are they? I have no idea. Uh, right now, NATO has just begun. They have just set up an office which quantifies civilian casualties. They need to be more than that, though. We need to be able to do not only quantification, uh, but also understanding of how it happens, so they can then be fed into a lessons learned system, so we will improve civilian civilian protections, so that we're not sitting here talking about thousands of people dying, uh, so, that, so that things can really improve. Lastly, and this may be the most bland and dry of all, but I think it's a, an important issue, and it feeds back into the very beginning when I spoke about Israel and the Gaza operation, and their very loose rules of engagement, etc. Doctrine is critical. I truly believe doctrine is critical. And looking at it from two sides, militaries in the field, I have found, do one of two things. They either go with the most force that we are legally allowed to use, or they go with the most force that they need to use. And I think they really need to look for, the, uh, for, for which way that you're, you're going to uh, apply force. When we are in, for example, a, a, um, uh, an existential war, perhaps you may need to use most force allowed. But when we're looking at conflicts as we have now in Iraq and Afghanistan, you definitely want to push back from that. And I think Petraeus and others have started to do that. We need to start looking at a most force needed. It's much more along the lines of the British uh, situation. And with, 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 with apologies, I, I know there may have been issues in the past, but you know, this is uh, 2009 and, and not uh, the 1700s. Uh, and so you know, the, the United Kingdom has uh, some important things to bring to the table. We have a lot of lessons that we can learn from the way that they, they work there. So I've thrown a lot of stuff out, uh, some, I, some ideas. I just want you to understand that when I go out there in the field, when I'm in a conflict zone, you know, we're dealing with the reality of, of blood and guts and fighting and trying to get things stopped and trying to improve things. Uh, you know, we need to talk about some of these larger world issues, but for me, you know, what do I have to work with? I have IHL, because that's what everybody has agreed to implement. That is what everyone's agreed is the standard. So that's the standard that we're gonna hold everyone to. And hopefully we can improve the adherence to IHL and that will, in turn, improve civilian protections. Thank you. Wars of occupation. We've talked about wars of conquest. Uh, and I'd like to thank Mark for uh, his compliments to my countrymen, uh, because you've probably got a terrible, terrible view of what the English have left to history, particularly to your country, uh, with regard to conquering people. Well, I should say in passing, incidentally, that um, the English were no worse than the uh, other colonial powers at that time. Uh, look at what the Dutch did in the East Indies, look at what the French did in Africa. I rest my case. Um, even the Swedes, those nice Swedes, ask yourself what they did in the 17th century in Eastern Europe. Um, what I am fairly convinced of is that my theme Civilians do have ways of protecting themselves, but particularly relevant in, in the civil wars, not necessarily wars of occupation. Uh, my reason for advancing this sort of idea is um, that we've been doing some work in the Institute over the last, oh, I guess, seven or eight years now, on efforts by local people to create 
peace communities, peace zones in various situations of, of, of civil strife, civil wars. Um, in Colombia, they call it experiencias de paz. Um, and it seems to me that from the situations that we've looked at in Colombia, in the Philippines, in El Salvador, Guatemala, and around the other places, Sri Lanka, for example, that civilians are remarkably, um, I was going to say clever, but that's not quite the right word. They're remarkably adaptable in ways in which they do try to protect themselves. Um, at the moment, I'm working on the idea that uh, you know, if, if you are in a situation when you are either being fought over or you're being targeted, and in passing, those are two very different situations. Uh, if you simply happen to be on in the combat zone, that's one thing. If, on the other hand, one or other of the combatants decide that you have something that they want, or that you are an obstacle to them, or that you are somebody who is the a resource before the break, then you're in a slightly different situation. Um, but whatever whatever the problem that the local population is, the local grassroots population, it seems to me that they've got about, they've got about five uh, options. Um, and this I jotted down some weeks ago and I kept it. Uh, one is to keep your heads down and hope that people will go away and leave you alone. You know, what you can call a quiescent approach. Now that actually works in some circumstances depending upon whether you are in a combat zone or whether you are in a zone which is clear, clearly controlled by one side or the other. And I emphasize one side or the other because one of the, more, the quietest places that I've ever come across in Colombia for a number of years was a place which was entirely controlled by the insurgents. The insurgents had set up a social structure there which was working perfectly well. There were schools, there was a medical service, etc., etc. Um, on the other hand, often if you find yourselves in a zone where there is fighting, option number two is flight. You leave, you get the hell out. Uh, you become an IDP uh, and you flee to the nearest sanctuary which may or may not be within your country. And then incidentally sometimes you decide to go back and to set up yourself again, either in a place that you fled from or somewhere nearby. You try to go home. The question then is how do you go home and you protect yourself. Thirdly, there's what I call the Kurosawa option. You uh, uh, either arm yourself or you hire armed people to protect yourself against those who are threatening your security. Any of you have seen a wonderful Japanese film, Seven Samurai, or the American adaption of it called Magnificent Seven, will recognize what I call the Kurosawa. I don't th maybe it exists in reality, but maybe not just in um, the fourth option is adherence and partiality. You can throw your weight, whatever it is, on one side or the other uh, of, the, of the struggle and hope that that side will protect you and that it will prevail. The fifth one is the one that I'm mostly interested in and that our research is concentrated on, and that's what we call uh, withdrawal and neutrality. Uh, it's a situation where local people, for some reason or another, decide that they've had enough and they want, they want to withdraw, they want to leave, they want to declare themselves a peace community or a peace zone. And often this is done partly because uh, they're in such a desperate situation that this is the only option that they can think of. Um, We've looked at a, a huge number of these in Colombia. We've looked at some in the Philippines where the movement, I think, started. Um, the pattern that emerges is that local people, local communities, somehow get to a point where something snaps. They've been under stress, they've been under pressure, uh, they've been facing a situation where people are fighting over them, through them, around them. And then something happens that uh, pushes them over to some kind of a some kind of a precipice, and they decide that they, they have to take some action. Um, I'm thinking of one particular case in the Philippines where a local community, an indigenous community in northern Luzon, uh, was uh, being fought over by the armed forces of the Philippines and the New People's Army, and the NPA got 
caught in an ambush uh, by, the, uh, by the army. Uh, several of their people were killed. And the army said that the local village, um, the ambush took place on the front river, which actually supplied the uh, community with it. And there were, there were bodies floating there were, there were bodies. And the uh, army said, leave them, don't touch them. It would be a lesson to everybody. It so outraged the local community. It was their water supply. It was also, you don't leave dead bodies unburied. Un un the, the local priests and all the women in the village got together in a, in a, in a, in a procession, went in a procession to the uh, side of the ambush, took the, took the guerrillas, what was left of them, and gave them a decent burial. And then they decided they were going to declare themselves everybody, army, guerrillas, anybody else, it was going to be a peace zone. Nobody could come in with guns, nobody could come in uh, 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 without actually pushing um, to a local community. And the next time an army patrol came through, everybody in the village got together in the main street of the army, mobbed the patrol, said to the young lieutenant in charge, do you realize that uh, your commanding officer has forbidden you to come through here, this is terrible, put your guns down, we're going to get on the phone and get back to your headquarters. And they bluffed the army patrol to leave, and the army didn't come back. Um, it, this is not an easy thing to do, as I say, our, our findings about local people setting up local neutral zones is an incredibly difficult thing to do. It's an incredibly difficult if you're in a position, as many of the communities are in Colombia, you're actually frequently dealing with three sets of armed actors. You're dealing with the army, you're dealing with the guerrillas, and in Colombia, you're dealing with a series of paramilitaries that actually operate with and beyond the bounds of the, of the state military. What we found is, oddly enough, that the easiest people to deal with, the easiest people to convince that you should be left alone, are the guerrillas, frequently because they recruit locally. So it's perfectly possible to talk to somebody in your village and say, look, um, you know, uh, your nephew is the local commander, is the local guerrilla commander. Go and talk to him, to explain to him what we're up to, uh, explain to him that we are declaring ourselves a peace zone, explain to him that we're setting up a democratic system, explain to him that we're all for development. We're doing things that the guerrilla organization says they want long term. Well, we're doing it. Ask him to leave us alone, to leave us alone. And frequently you can negotiate with these people to be left alone. Uh, to draw a notional or a real battle sometimes in an area which is disarmed, which is free from violence. More difficult, of course, are the state armed actors. The local army commandant, the local, um, local police. Uh, no, because their reaction is, well, wait a minute, we're the, we're, we're the representatives of, of your government. You know, and the answer that your go you know, the government hasn't done anything for us for the last 30 odd years, so who cares? It doesn't work. So to, to make an agreement with the local military commander, you have to use other arguments and other, other ways of persuading. The most difficult in Colombia, of course, turn out the paramilitaries. Because frequently the paramilitaries are not fighting over you. They're trying to drive you out. Because you're sitting on something that is valuable to them. And you are a target. So if one is unfortunate enough to be in an area which is being fought over by state forces, guerrillas, and paramilitaries, then the task of actually maintaining yourself as a peace community is enormously complicated. Um, local people, though, are not simply interested in what goes on in their own village or their own town or their own community. Another thing we found is that whereas we started our research by thinking, oh, there are these hundred or so peace communities in Colombia, wouldn't it be interesting to ask why some of them survive and prosper and why others don't. Um, we rapidly found that uh, local people uh, try to build up from the grassroots and they try to build up regionally. You know, there are whole areas in Colombia from about uh, 1998 uh, 
right through until about 2004, where starting with some small local grassroots peace communities, these have expanded into very large associations that um, deal not with the local guerrilla force, but deal with the regional guerrilla force, and argue with them about not blocking off communications from villages to villages. <coughs> argue about releasing people that they've kidnapped on the grounds that the kidnapped person's second cousin they think is a gorilla. They go and argue along the lines of, that doesn't seem to be a very good reason for kidnapping these kids, that you think that their second cousin, three times removed, might be a gorilla. Um, you're giving yourself a bad reputation. They organize themselves into associations which are reasonable wide. They try to make contact organizations that help out with education about international human rights law. Uh, they try to make contact with organizations that are willing to send people to accompany them, to live with them, and to act as, um, uh, to act in a revelation role. This particular community is being threatened by a local guerrilla organization. Get on the cell phone, the cell phone Call to headquarters in Bogota, get the people in Bogota to ring London, and get the people in London to ring the people in New York, and get the people in New York to start putting some pressure on the State Department to do something about this. That can be remarkably effective. And I think it ties in with what Mark was saying about people. Watch. Um, the last thing I want to say, of course, is that uh, whether any of this works at all depends very largely upon not just what's going on at the local grassroots level. Remember, we're starting about talking with, sorry, talking about activities which happen in local villages and local towns in mainly the countryside. We're not talking about Gaza, we're not talking about major urban areas. Because a lot of third world, if we can still use that expression, conflict goes on in the countryside. Um, but it's always linked to what's happening in the national and again, just going back to Colombia, one of the interesting things that we have found, and again, this comes from something that uh, one of my students was talking about yesterday, is that there's a terrible difference now between what is taking place in Colombia now under the Uribe administration and what happened in the previous administration under President Pastrana. President Pastrana publicly didn't like local communities making their own peace deals He wasn't sufficiently exercised to do anything about it because for most of his presidency, he was trying to do a nation, national level deal with the guerrillas. When President Uribe came in, uh, he had a completely different attitude towards local peace building. His attitude was peacemaking, peace building is the job of the government. We do not approve of local people, as some of them have done uh, in the south of the country, making agreements, deals with the guerrillas um, about demining, for example. And that is the job of the central government. Uh, it is also, and this again is a, a, a policy called democratic security in Colombia, it is also immoral for people to declare themselves neutral in a struggle between the, government, the, the democratically elected government and the set of insurgents. So there should be absolutely no question of agents of the state being denied access to parts of the state territory. So the task for local peace making and peace building has become much more complicated because of what goes on at the national level. We're still not quite sure, it's an interesting question about what's the nexus between national peace making, which hasn't been going on really, six years, and the local level grassroots peacemaking, which can hope to protect some of the local population. It's a very complicated uh, nexus. Um, but um, there are many of the peace communities in Colombia, many of the police and peace communities that have been set up in the Philippines and are now in what we call the third wave of uh, local peace building that have survived and continue with great difficulty. Uh, on that point, I will ignore the um, note which has just told me I've got 
four minutes to go and finish.
they're the ones that fought. They're the ones that, that you know, their bullets and their bombs harmed the civilians, so where are they? What we're trying to do is get a new global expectation built that warring parties in conflict and after conflict will help the civilians they've harmed. It's actually a new concept. And there's a movement for it. There's a movement for it growing. The United States, for example, um, in Iraq and Afghanistan, will pay, has the ability to pay compensation to civilian prison harms. They don't always do it. They don't always do it perfectly, but it's there. Um, and it's a good effort, and it's a noble effort. Um, there are also humanitarian aid programs that my organization helped create with Senator Leahy um, that are US funded that specifically help victims of US combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, the Philippines now has legislation for compensation. Who would have thought that the Philippines would have this compensation bill that might pass their parliament? Um, Georgia started rebuilding homes after that clash in August 2008. Um, trying to think of some other places. It's not widespread, but it's growing. Um, and the civilians, we just did a report. Uh, I have some executive summaries up here. The cost and con consequences of civilian suffering in Afghanistan. For a year, we were on the ground in Afghanistan and interviewed 143 civilians who had been harmed in that war and 80 military officials and humanitarian workers and found out that Afghans expect some sort of compensation. This is what they expect. In that culture, if you harm somebody, you're supposed to either pay, you're supposed to apologize, you're supposed to somehow recognize this harm. Now, when the US says that they don't even keep casualty numbers, that's a slap in the face to anybody who has lost their mother. Where is their mother recorded? And not only that, but are, are they, you know, do Americans even know that they're and this, of course, is something that we want to have happen all over the world. There are two reasons that warring parties would do this. One is moral, it's the right thing to do. Um, and the second is strategic. And that, of course, is the hearts and minds stuff. That is Georgia rebuilding homes that Russian tanks fold over um, because they want that support from the local population. From my standpoint, and I know that it's incredibly important what their, what their reasoning is for some, from my standpoint, I don't care why they do it. I want those civilians to get some kind of help, um, whether it's compensation, humanitarian aid, whatever it may be. So what we've started is called the Making Amends Campaign. There's a website, makingamendscampaign.org. Um, and we're hoping that this will be the next thing that's going to change the lives of civilians in armed conflict. We're trying to change that landscape. Um, and given the movements that you've heard about, the cluster munitions, the landmines, all of these things that are going toward better protection better prevention of civilian harm. We hope to come at it from the back end and say, once they're harmed, when prevention efforts fail, every prevention effort that fails is a case of somebody who is left suffering, somebody who doesn't have their loved ones, somebody whose home is no longer there. Um, and we're trying to make the United States an example of this because there are already programs that exist. And one thing that we're trying to do, which I just want to mention, is close is get the Department of Defense to position an advisor, an ex-ambassador, a retired general, somebody with heft, get them to have a position at the Pentagon, a high, a high level position that would look at just what Mark was talking about before you go into war, the justification for war. How many civilians are we gonna kill? How many civilians are we gonna displace? All of that is really important. It doesn't necessarily get looked at as much as it should. Once, you, once that first shot is fired, how can we better our rules of engagement so that less civilians are harmed? How are we going to keep these numbers? You know, in Afghanistan, no numbers were kept on civilians that were harmed. If you don't know how many were harmed, how do you know if you're being proportional? How do you know that you are not killing too many civilians versus your military target? And now there's an ISAF civilian tracking cell, now, eight years after the war began. All of this needs to be put in place at, as soon as we start thinking that we're gonna go to war, as soon as that first shot is fired. And then how are you gonna pay compensation? Or how are you gonna get humanitarian aid to the civilians? Do they even want it from you? You know, the Lebanese don't want Israel to pay them compensation. They want nothing to do with Israel, and vice versa. 
but how can, you know, there are ways around that. There are ways, how can Israel pay into a common fund for victims? How can Lebanon do something similar for victims that it has harmed? Um, and all of this needs to be considered as, as we go into the next phase of what war looks like for civilians on the ground. Thanks. Sarah, you hardly used up your, your 20 minutes. I wonder if you could say just another few words about the nature of your program, because you only talked about uh, lobbying with, with, with Congress, but you also talked about traveling to some of these Oh, workers. sure. Um, so we also, we train the U.S. military. We're one of those organizations that believes that if we want the military to do something different, we have to go work with it. So I was just out at Fort Leavenworth. We've trained soldiers at Fort Belvoir and 29 Palms and um, all of these various military outlets. Um, Civic was founded in 2003 by a young woman. She was 28 years old when she was killed in Iraq on Airport Road. Um, her name was Marla Mazika. She was a young Californian, and she believed so passionately that her own country should be doing something more for the civilians that were harmed. She went to Afghanistan and saw the hospitals and went to the Pakistan border and saw all of these civilians who were just devastated and had never seen an American face. You know, and she knew. She knew these soldiers. She knew that they didn't mean to hurt these civilians, that they wouldn't have wanted to hurt these civilians. But how did the civilians know that? How did this mom who was grieving for eight of her lost family members, who I met in, in Kabul when a, when a U.S. airstrike missed its target by three miles and hit her home instead, took away her husband and seven children and her home, and she never saw an American face? How did she know that the United States didn't need to do this to her? Um, and then, Marla, the founder of my organization, went to Iraq as soon as Baghdad fell and saw the same thing happening. And so she started going door to door to figure out how many civilians had been armed by U.S. operations, put together these piles, came back to Washington, and basically put them on Senator Leahy's desk and said, all right, what are you going to do about this? Um, and he was caring enough and passionate enough about this issue to create the humanitarian programs that I discussed. But we are advocates. We go around and we film civilians telling their stories, we take pictures of them, we get documentation of what they went through. Um, we don't have the same kind of methodology as Human Rights Watch. They're a really research-based organization. We want to get the voices of civilians. We want to get what are you going through? How were you harmed? How did you feel about it? What, what did you expect in return? And you can bet that nobody says, I expect to be ignored. Um, so that's what we take to policy all around the world whenever there's a conflict and say, those civilians that you aren't are still there. You may be fine when it comes to the UN. You may have made peace with your neighbor, but those civilians are still harmed and they still won't have a place to live and they're still mourning the loss of their son. So what are you gonna do about that? Um, but we're very small, we have five people. So to be the only ones doing this, um, we really need a lot of support. So I, I hope that you all log on Tried 
from other side, no justice. Let people just live, just not kill everybody. People do. If you will try to impeach, I mean, if you will try to do anything about justice, people will continue to kill you and defend themselves. So I see you in like harmony together. My question is, do you see these competing narratives on the ground and how to address this issue? And we found it is very, very important. Yeah, I, I definitely. Yeah, I definitely see the competing narratives. Uh, I, I definitely see times when people either want justice or they just want it, let it go away and let us live our lives. Um, but from our, you know, our organizational perspective, we are obviously looking for, uh, for justice. And you also have to, to look at incidents, uh, see whether it's a legal uh, attack or not. You know, we're working with IHL, which sometimes is not very, very fulfilling, to be honest with you. And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do. And then also to see where can we take it. For example, one of the most asked questions to me by Palestinians in Gaza uh, during and after the conflict was, you know, what can we do? You know, they've destroyed this or killed this person or, 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 or what have you. Where can we take our case? And, and oftentimes that is not clear. Oftentimes it's not obvious. Uh, many of them were looking to the ICC, for example, you have the problem with the ICC that one, Israel is not a party to it, and secondly, the Palestinian Authority does not have uh, the, the requisite requirements for, for statehood, and so you, you, you can't uh, uh, you know, approach an, an ICC investigation. So then what do you do? So it's not always clear of what the redress is, and that's, uh, that's hard. Okay, Jason? Yeah, I have a question for Mark. Um, you're talking about how international agreements work, and um, I don't want to sound like an ignorant American, but I wonder how much weight something like the ICC holds without the involvement of the U.S. You're talking about how the U.S. involvement is important. And in fact, I think that was the argument that Bashir used, that you know, without the U.S.'s involvement, the ICC didn't really matter much. And so I wonder then, you know, how much weight does something like the ICC hold, and what can we do to uh, pressure the new administration to, you know, working with the ICC and things like that. Uh, banning landmines. Well, when uh, when Lipni from Israel uh, went and took a trip to Belgium uh, during the conflict, uh, she stayed on the plane for a while uh, because there were reports that the Belgians were going to grab her and and, and, uh, and and bring her to the ICC. Uh, it eventually, it didn't happen. But those are serious concerns. And I tell you this: if I was an Israeli soldier or an Israeli politician who's involved in cast lead, I would be going around with a list of ICC countries in my back pocket before I traveled anywhere. Now, you never know what's going to happen, uh, but that uh, that threat is so strong that you have a, 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 you know, a country prime minister saying that we're not going to allow anyone to, to look at what our, our people have done. And, you know, clearly that's going to constrict their, their, their options, and that's going to put a little bit of fear uh, into them, and maybe that's a good thing, and maybe that, you know, can build on stuff. One of the problems that we have, though, is clearly the ICC cannot mean justice for Africa. Okay, it can't just be the ICC for Africa. All right, we can't just look at the Bashir indictment and say, okay, that's it. You know, one of the problems that we're hearing from having from a lot of countries that we deal with is they say, well, what about all of these other either you know northern hemisphere or western uh, hemisphere countries that are doing things? And I think there's a lot to be said for that, and, and we have to look at the uh, applicability of it in the future. But it's still an important body. The idea when a state is either unwilling or unable to prosecute someone. Now, looking at the Mine Ban Treaty, we now have 156 nations on board. What do we have? 190, what, 97 nations in the world? Pretty damn good. Uh, no one's going to be using landmines again, if you ask me. And the Cluster Munition Treaty, while we may only have now 95 nations on board for that, the stigma out there is so strong that if anyone uses cluster munitions again in the future, that, you know, all hell's going to come crashing down on them. Uh, so there's the, these international agreements. Even if they don't have an immediate effect on, on changing someone, uh, on putting someone in jail, they can have an effect on changing behavior. And that's perhaps just as important. I'd like to see if uh, either of the other panelists wants to comment about either of us. Just a comment on, on the mind ban. Uh, I think Mark's right as regards state actors. But the problem is that there are a lot of non state actors that still getting those on board any kind of regime that actually bans them completely is going to be a very difficult job. 
true, which is why, as, as part of the mine ban treaty, you know, there's a no production, stockpiling, or transfer. Now, yes, there are a lot of mines in, in, in stockpiles now, and that's something that would have to be dealt with, but you know, I think that at least uh, assists. Before we proceed with the next question, I'd like just to make an announcement. We were supposed to have a student's forum after this panel. Now we are blending the two together because of time constraints, so this is your chance to involve anybody, the four panelists, and even others if you like with the questions, and this panel will expand a little bit further. So the next question will be yours. Yeah, my question is also for Mr. Glasgow. Uh, just a real quick question um, about human rights monitors and uh, their engaging with the military and vice versa. You said that the U.S. and the uh, U.K. are both involved, um, starting to get more and more involved with this. I was seeing if there's anyone else in any other countries that are um, accepting the fact that they need to do this to help them um, globally and just to help civilians. And I was seeing if you had any more insight about uh, any other countries besides the U.S. and the U.K. that uh, also are involved? NATO, to some extent, uh, NATO uh, has us come and brief them uh, quite regularly. Uh, but uh, to be honest with you, other than those, no. We have a very um, adversarial relationship with a lot of the world's militaries. Uh, some of them, it's very understandable <laughs> because they're abusers, and others, I think, it's just because of uh, mistrust or lack of but yeah, so NATO, US, UK. All right, um, actually I have a comment, not a question. Um, first of all, I come from Lebanon, and obviously it's a country that has suffered war and knows what war is. Um, so uh, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to see that all those people care. Um, also, I'm a civilian, and I've seen devastation. I in the recent Gaza conflict, I was in Egypt, and there were, of course, lots of injured people, uh, injured people from Gaza coming to Egypt. And I saw them, and I met with them, and I saw their grievances. And I thought, what should I do about it? <laughs> and I thought that I should turn to ICAR because they are people who want to solve conflicts. Um, and here's what I saw. I, I saw that we say what the U.S. should do, what countries should do, what perpetrators should do, what they should do. But what should we do? I mean, I, I think that we should inter in introspect. Are we in any way contributing to these conflicts? Are we in any way contributing to this civilian de devastation? Do we condemn civilian de devastation? I mean, apparently we do. But I haven't heard a clear wrong, a clear this is right and this is wrong. Sarah is saying that no civilians expect to be ignored. Actually. I'm a civilian from those places, and I spoke to them. And what they say is that, are we dogs? Dogs are better, they have animal rights, animal rights to speak for them. But we die, and no one speaks for us. So I came here, and I came to speak, and I expected that we do something. I wanted God to do something about it. But the answer was, well, we need to represent the other side. Okay, you can speak, you can say what you saw, but the Israelis need to speak. And I'm here, I'm not, I'm not talking about politics, I'm not talking about the, the peace plan for the Middle East, I'm just thinking about talking about civilian devastation. And I don't know why victims have to sit side by side and make sure that the perpetrators were there. And so before we come and talk to these people and to the governments, we need to make sure that we stand up for this first. Um, earlier we said that there there is normalization going on, that slavery is, is wrong, that, um, that civil devastation is wrong. I don't see this normalization. I see that now we can speak about slavery, that it was wrong after, I don't know, 100 years that it was banned. But I think even our, the way we're proceeding, if we were back to slavery times, I, I don't think we would have said it's wrong. I, I think we really need to stand up and, and, and actually have confidence and say that something is wrong. Uh, any comments from the panel? Okay, David's question. I think this is mainly for 
to Mark and Sarah. Um, and forgive me if this has a couple of moving parts to it. My worry, and I think this follows on from what the old woman was just saying, is that by not working with the underlying thinking and system of legitimate conduct in the military and governmental thinking that you are working in parallel with, in, in concert with, although I very much agree that if you want to change something, you will need to work with them directly, and I've, I've done that sort of work myself, that in a sense, you are essentially legitimizing and making the war easier to pursue. Your action addresses a symptom that allows a bad paradigm to continue, especially in the case where you're talking about an asymmetrical situation in which to assume that these two sides are operating or should operate or can operate on the same sheet of music, I would say is essentially simply incorrect. And to push that is an imposition of the same set of rules in a situation where that, that simply does not apply and something else needs to be pursued in that case. Um, one of the analogies that I have in mind thinking of this is development work that I've done within Israel and Palestine where the, what I think is a very legitimate criticism of that work is the development is great, but essentially what you're doing is making the occupation easier to bear. The point is not to be well developed within a situation of occupation, the point is to end the occupation. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about whether that kind of thinking comes into what you're doing, if that's brought up, how do you address that kind of a, a critique? I, I like the uh, last comment you made about the occupation issue. And our Middle East Division actually does work on, on that kind of thing. That's just an, that, that's an aside. I, I will say first that I don't think the Israelis or other militaries that we criticize, or if we criticize Hezbollah at times, or Hamas, or other non-state actors, uh, would look to us as legitimizing their conflicts. Uh, they don't like us very much, to be honest. We're very critical of them, and, and, and that's how it is. I completely understand what you're saying. If you're working within rules that are right now, um, perhaps at times, seem to be leading to civilian harm, but then aren't you, aren't you uh, legitimizing that harm? I will just say that for our organization, for Human Rights Watch, international humanitarian law is the, is the standard that's accepted worldwide. And so that's the, those are the rules that we have to work with. And within that construct, within that framework, uh, we then make our criticisms. Now, there are times when we try to stretch it. There are times when we say just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. And there are times when, uh, when we'll say just because what you're doing uh, is legal, you need to also look at the additional harm that, that's being caused. And it's, it's interesting, I have some uh, US military uh, personnel, for example, who come back and say, look, you know, this is a legal act. Uh, why do you want anything more than that? And then you try to explain to them the logical reasons for it. And so we do try to push it, you try to press a little bit further. And there are times when we do go beyond the mandate of IHL very carefully, uh, because then we'll get heavily criticized for it. But I have to say that's the, those are the rules under which we operate. And that's just as an organizational choice. And from my end, I get a lot of the pushback on what we do as, aren't you just helping war parties clean up what they did and making it easier for them to just go ahead and harm civilians? Um, and I would say absolutely not. Um, if, you, if you look at it from a different perspective, would you prefer that warring parties completely devastate the civilian population and the civilians get nothing? Because that's what currently happens and that's what's going to happen if we don't need to repress them to actually help where they've harmed. So I would much prefer to look like I'm helping them clean up than the civilians get nothing. I care about the civilians. If the, if the warring party gets great press over that, fine. But that woman who just lost her husband now has a way to live. She now has a livelihood. She can now take care of her children. That's what I care about. Um, and if you look at it from a different standpoint, in terms of, you know, I, I also get the, well, why aren't you working on protection? Why aren't you working on prevention? Those are amazing efforts. I mean, I want everyone who's working on protection and prevention to work me out of a job. I will go do something else, absolutely. But there needs to be somebody who is the voice for the people that you met and that you talked to. There needs to be 
somebody who was going to the war and party saying, look, you can't just leave them. Um, and in terms of what we do, then bolstering protection and prevention and making it harder for war and parties to go to war, if they have to keep numbers, then they're gonna be held accountable. If they have to keep numbers on how many civilians they actually killed, and it's really high, or it's just one, then we can hold them accountable for that, and we can say, here's what you did, here's what you need to do better, and here's, here's where it's gonna cost you. We're gonna make you pay for this. But just a little quick, we have limited resources. Sarah's got five people. You know, in, in my emergencies division, the people that deploy with 24-hour notice, we have five people. Uh, we're the only ones who you know, are trained to do this kind of work, so it's... We can't do it you know, I, Yeah, if, if I can follow that up for a second. Yes, it's all compensation. In fact, the U.S. military doesn't get training on compensation. 
most soldiers, uh, Marines, don't even know that such a program exists. So when they get deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq, they, they harm somebody unintentionally. Most of them are racked with guilt. They have no idea what to do. Some of them dip into their own pockets to find money to, to pay the family. Um, so it's, it's something that's necessary to get institutionalized, which is why Senator Leahy now has legislation that we're hoping he'll introduce this spring to institutionalize the compensation system. Okay. Um, one of the things that we found that helps at least to explain why these peace communities survive is um, uh, the degree of internal unity and coherence that they have. Uh, and in some cases, that's based upon Religion. In other cases, it's based upon the communities are either Afro-Colombian or they're indigenous, and therefore they have sort of shared values that, that helps them cohere. Um, on the other hand, um, many of the communities that have actually either returned and established themselves uh, or have stayed in place and managed to survive have been very greatly helped by religious organizations in Colombia. I mean, Christi here in Cuba, for example, which is Catholic. The Mennonites have done a great deal of work, I think, not just in Maria. Um, I mean, the, the, the only other thing that I can say is um, it's it always as well to keep in mind that we found that religious organizations are not unitary. And therefore, you will find some people, for example, in the Catholic Church in, in, in Colombia, uh, and also in, in, um, in Luzon, uh, where you know, local priests are very supportive to the establishment of local priest communities. Uh, the church hierarchy, you know, back in uh, the cities, uh, regards these people as supporting the guerrillas. So there's a sort of division within the church organizations in, in, in the countries that we've looked at. Uh, as to whether, in fact, they would support the, the continuation of these communities. But it's certainly an important element in, in keeping the coherence, keeping them together, keeping them, uh, keeping them sort of convinced that what they're doing is, is worthwhile and will continue. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, I have two questions. 